Good morning and welcome to worship at Beulah Presbyterian Church. We are so glad that we've come together as a faith community to give thanks and praise to the living God. And we're so glad that you have joined us by Facebook, YouTube, or sermon by phone. I have some announcements uh, this morning. Uh, next Sunday, October the 25th, is our Dedication Sunday. Uh, normally, we would uh, do the dedication during worship, but in a COVID-19 world, uh, we're going to do that outside at noon. So if you would like to bring your pledge cards, we'll be over by the uh, uh, former preschool entrance, uh, the covered crosswalk there, and we will bless your uh, pledge card and uh, thank you so very much for your time, talent, and treasure that you are giving to the life and ministry of God's church. I also want to remind you that the next day, the 26th of October, is the second annual blood drive in honor of our very own Dan Biller. Uh, if you would like to sign up to donate blood, uh, you can go to the American Red Cross website and simply put in Beulah Presbyterian Church and we should pop up and you should be able to pick the time that you want to come on the 26th, which is a Monday. And during this time of generosity, we will have a pause for generosity from our very own Ashley Hostetter. So you wanna know how generosity has impacted my life? In only three minutes, let's go. Grandmother Dee Dee wanted to learn to play an instrument so badly, but she grew up in the Great Depression with no money. So she made sure that both of her children and all six of her grandchildren learned to play music. Our grandmother's generosity flourished when my cousin Jason became a concert violinist with the Houston Symphony. He also teaches orchestra at a performing arts academy in Texas, extending our grandmother's generosity to another generation. And me? Well, I like to sing in my car. I would walk 500 miles and I would walk 500 more just to be. Generosity of spirit number 372, giving you that lovely earworm. When I was nine, I wanted to join the band, but my parents couldn't afford to rent an instrument. So my cousin Shonda gave me the clarinet she had played in high school marching band. Shonda's generosity kick-started a lifetime of experiences and memories and played a huge role in creating my love of music. In fact, I still play the clarinet. And it's thanks to that and being in the marching band in high school and college that I met my husband, Patrick. When my mother, Pam, was only 16 years old, she had the opportunity to go to Europe for three months as a study abroad. The whole family pitched in doing extra jobs around town to make up the money to send Pam to Europe. Flash forward a generation. I'm 15 years old and I've been nominated to be a people-to-people -people student ambassador. My mother, who was a full-time teacher, took on a part-time job working at Myers Garden Center every day for six months to help send me to Europe. This outrageous act of generosity sparked a love of travel, a joy of French language, and many shared memories that mother and daughter could cherish together. Also, thanks to the generosity of one Hija Han and my lovely church family at Beulah, I was also afforded the opportunity to go to South Korea. I would not have been able to do that without the monetary support and prayers from many of you. I also owe a big debt of gratitude to many friends and teachers along the way who inspired me to do things that they saw I could do when I often couldn't see them for myself, including theater. Oh, so much theater. <sighs> yes, my life has greatly been impacted by the time, talent, and treasure shared with me and others so freely. I definitely would not be where I am today without it. I can never say enough thanks to all of you for showing me so many ways to pay it forward. Will you now join me 
in the call to worship. In worship, may we be as welcoming as Sarah and Abraham, who are quick to serve the stranger. In faith, may we proclaim that nothing is too big for God. In moments of holy surprise, we be laugh with deep and abiding joy. For God is in the holy surprise. God is in the winding path. And God is in our presence today. Let us worship God. Holy God. Joyful, joyful, we adore thee, God of glory, Lord of love. Hearts unfold like flowers before thee, opening to the sun above. Melt the clouds of sin and sadness, drive the dark of doubt away. Giver of immortal Gladness, fill us with the light of day. Please join me in the prayer for confession. God of unexpected joy and answered prayers, we confess that sometimes things feel too good to be true, while at other times we wonder if you hear us at all. When life unravels for the worst, we blame you. But when life unravels for the best, filling our days with holy surprise, we tend to praise ourselves, thinking we've earned this great expected joy. Forgive us. Help us to see in your midst, and with every breath that turns into a laugh, draw us closer to you. Amen. <clears throat> Be assured of pardon, for righteousness does not come from our own doing or not doing. Righteousness comes from God by faith. Through the faithfulness of Christ our Lord, we are forgiven. <sighs> Join me in sharing the peace of Christ with one another, be it, a, be it a wave, a smile, a nod, an email, share the peace of Christ with our, with our holy family. Please join me in the prayer for illumination. Holy Spirit of God, shine your light upon this word and into our hearts that we may be enlightened with fresh understanding. Amen. Today's scripture comes from Genesis chapter 18 verses 1 through 15 and chapter 21 verses 1 through 7. The Lord appeared to Abraham by the oaks of Mamre as he sat at the entrance of his tent in the heat of the day. He looked up and saw three men standing near him. When he saw them, he ran from the tent entrance to meet them and bowed down to the ground. He said, My Lord, if I find favor with you, do not pass by your servant. Let a little water be brought and wash your feet and rest yourselves under the tree. Let me bring a little bread that you may refresh yourselves and after that, you may pass on, since you have come to your servant. So they said, do as you have said. And Abraham hastened into the tent to Sarah and said, make ready quickly three measures of choice flour, knead it and make cakes. Abraham ran to the herd and took a calf, tender and good, and gave it to the servant who hastened to prepare it. Then he took curds and milk and the calf that he had prepared and set it before them. And he stood by them under the tree while they ate. They said to him, where is your wife, Sarah? 
And he said, there in the tent. Then one said, I will surely return to you in due season and your wife Sarah shall have a son. And Sarah was listening at the tent entrance behind him. Now Abraham and Sarah were old, advanced in age. It had ceased to be with Sarah after the manner of women. So Sarah laughed to herself saying, after I have grown old and my husband is old, shall I still have pleasure? The Lord said to Abraham, why did Sarah laugh and say, shall I indeed bear a child now that I am old? Is anything too wonderful for the Lord? At the set time, I will return to you and in due season, and Sarah shall have a son. But Sarah denied it saying, I did not laugh for she was afraid. He said, oh yes, you did laugh. So the Lord dealt with Sarah as he had said, and the Lord did for Sarah as he had promised. Sarah conceived and bore Abraham a son in his old age, at the time of which God had spoken to him. Abraham gave the name Isaac to his son, whom Sarah bore him, and Abraham circumcised his son Isaac when he was eight days old, as God had commanded him. Now Abraham was a hundred years old when his son Isaac was born to him. Sarah said, God has brought laughter for me. Everyone who hears will laugh with me. And she said, who would have ever said to Abraham that Sarah would nurse children? Yet I have borne him a son in his old age. The word of the Lord. Thanks be to God. Do you know a good storyteller? And I don't mean someone that makes up things. I mean someone that can tell you truthful stories in such a unique and clear way that you see the truth in the story. And maybe it's a story that you've heard over and over and over again, but when they tell it, it's like the first time you've heard it and you go, wow, that's a great story. For me, great storytellers include my mamma, Captain Kangaroo, you can't forget Captain Kangaroo, and of course, Mr. Rogers, and Chuck Nose Church, and Maya Angelou. What a storyteller there. But I have to say my all-time favorite, and you're not gonna be surprised by this, is Frederick Buechner. Yep. He's a sterling theologian and a fantastic storyteller who retells the stories, the foundational stories of the Bible in memorable and thought-provoking ways. And one of the, the best Bible stories his, he tells is the following. The place to start, tells Buechner, is with a woman laughing. She's an old woman. And after a lifetime in the desert, her face is cracked and rutted like a six month drought. She hunches her shoulders up around her ears and she just starts to shake. She's laughing because she's pushing 91 and has just been told that she's gonna have a baby. Even though it was an angel who told her she can't control herself. And of course, her husband can't control himself either. And he tries to keep a straight face just for a few seconds longer than she does, but he ends up cracking up too. And even the angel hides his mouth behind his golden sepulcher. Of course, the old woman is Sarah and the old man is Abraham. They're laughing at the idea of a baby being born in the geriatric ward and Medicare picking up the tab. They're laughing because the angel not only seems to believe that it's going to happen, but seems to expect them to believe as well. They're laughing because with part of themselves, they do believe it. They're laughing because with another part of themselves, they know it would be a fool to believe it. They're laughing because it's better than crying 
and maybe not even all that different. They're laughing because by some crazy chance it should just happen to come true, then they really would have something to laugh about. They're laughing at God and with God, and they're laughing at themselves too, because laughter has that in common with weeping, because sooner or later, both wind up being about ourselves and our lives. And Sarah and Abraham, they had a good life. Years before, they had gotten off to a great start in Mesopotamia. They had a great ranch house, three-car garage, outdoor cooking center, all the electronics you could ever want. They had a room all fixed up for when the babies started coming. They had a future. And then they got religion, or rather religion got them. And Abraham was convinced that what God wanted them to do was to pull up stakes and head out for Canaan, where God had promised that God would make Abraham the father of a great nation, which in turn would be a blessing to all nations. So that's what they did. And that's where their troubles began. So they put the house up on the market and gave the electronics to the hospital and got a good price for the crib and the bassinet because they'd never been used and were, you know, as good as new. So off they went in their suburban with a U-Haul behind them and a handful of friends and relatives as well who, you know, if they didn't share Abraham's religious convictions, um, they still decided to hitch their wagon to his star anyway. And among the people they took was the brother-in-law, Lot. And that turned out to be a big mistake. The first thing that went wrong on their journey took place when the Egyptian pharaoh was struck by Sarah's beauty and made a serious play for her. Abraham, fearing that if the pharaoh discovered that she was a married woman, might decide to get rid of the husband, Notice Abraham is not concerned about Sarah's plight. And so Abraham advises that Sarah is, um, yeah, she's just, uh, yeah, she's just my sister. She's not my wife. And let the chips fall where they might. Well, this led to a complicated domestic situation that almost cost Abraham, the woman who was to be the mother of the great nation, and from which Abram had to finally extricate himself by admitting that he'd lied, and thereby sustaining a considerable loss of both face and credibility. The next thing that went wrong in this Christmas vacation, like drama in the desert, took place when they finally limped into the promised land, and a nasty situation developed between Abram and his in-laws. Lot and his crowd claimed that the place wasn't big enough for the both of them, and Abraham's crowd said they couldn't agree more. So as a way out of this impasse, Abraham proposed that they divide the land in two and each take a half. Well, Abraham made the mistake of telling Lot, you go first. So, of course, Lot took the half that was fertile pasture land around the Jordan River. And Abraham was left with a disaster area around Dead Man's Gulch. In other words, all of Canaan was the promised land, but some parts were more promising than others. The next thing I think was the worst chosen by God to be the prospective father of a great nation, Abraham made the discovery that he didn't stand a chance of becoming a father of anything because after extensive medical examinations and procedures and huge medical bills, all the leading authorities agreed that Sarah was as barren as most of the real estate that Lot had left them with. So the years rolled by until finally Abraham was 100 and Sarah was 
90. And the angel arrived to make a shattering announcement. The angel said that when God made a promise, God stuck to it. And Sarah was going to have a baby boy. Then they laughed. One account in the Bible says that Abraham laughed until he fell on his face. And the other account says that Sarah was the one who did it. This is the account that uh, Holly read today. She was hiding behind the door of the tent, and when the angel spoke, it was her laughter that got them all going. And according to today's reading, God intervened then and asked about Sarah's laughter, and Sarah, scared stiff, denied the whole thing. And then God said, no, no, you did laugh. And of course, God was correct. Maybe the most interesting part of it all is that far from getting angry at them for laughing, God told them that when the baby was born, they were to name the baby Isaac. And in Hebrew, Isaac means laughter. So you can say that God not only tolerated their laughter, but blessed it. And in a sense, joined in it which makes it very special laughter, doesn't it? God and humanity laughing together, sharing a glorious joke in which both of them are involved. But where, where did that laughter come from? Where does our laughter come from? It comes from a deep a place as tears come from. And in a way, that comes from the same place. As much as tears do it, it comes from the darkness of a world where God is, of all missing persons, the most missed. Except that it comes not as an ally of darkness, but as its adversary. Not as a symptom of darkness, but as its antidote. The laughter of Abraham and Sarah doesn't eliminate the darkness because through the long childless years of the past darkness has already taken its toll and in the long years that lie ahead there will be darkness still as for instance when Abraham is asked to take that child of promise and offer him to God as a burnt offering they both still have to face the darkness of death and of a life in a world where God is seen at best only from afar and through a glass darkly. But with their laughter, something new breaks open and it goes into their darkness and it is something so unexpected and preposterous that they can't help but laugh. In astonishment. And those strangers who appeared at their tent door, they just thought they were there to read the meter. And who were they? They were angels. Who could have possibly thought that someone would have grabbed an angel by the wing and pulled him down out of the sky and contrived for him to give such astonishing news to this elderly couple? It all happened not of necessity, not inevitably, but gratuitously, freely, and hilariously. And what was astonishing gratuitous and hilarious, of course. It was the grace of God who yanked that angel down that day. What could they do but laugh at the absurdness of it? And they laughed until the tears ran down their cheeks and God was in on the joke. Like Abraham and Sarah, we are a people who are prepared for everything except for the fact that beyond the darkness of their blindness, there is a great light. They're prepared for going 
on, breaking their backs, plowing the same old field until the cows come home without seeing, at least until they stub their toes on it, that there's a treasure buried in the field rich enough to buy the state of Texas. They're prepared for a God who strikes hard bargains, but not for a God who gives them as much for an hour's work as for a day's. They're prepared for a mustard seed kingdom of God, no bigger than the eye of a flea, but not, not for the great orchestral chorus that it becomes with birds in the branches singing Mozart. They're prepared for potluck supper at the Presbyterian Church, but not for the marriage supper of the Lamb. And when the bridegroom finally arrives at midnight with vine leaves in his hair, they turn up their lamps to light him on his way, only they've forgotten the oil to light them. And they stand there with big, bare, virginal feet glimmering faintly in the dark. The good news breaks into a world where the news has been so bad for so long that when it is good, nobody hears it much except for a few. And who are the few that hear it? Rich or poor, successes or failures as the world counts it, they're the ones who are willing to believe in miracles because they know it will take a miracle to fill that empty place in them where grace and peace should be found. Old Sarah knows it took a miracle to fill the empty place inside her where she waits for a baby that will never come. So when the angel appears and tells her about the baby, she laughs, and Abraham laughs with her because having used up all their tears, they have nothing but laughter left. Because although what the angel says may be too good to be true, well, who knows? Maybe the truth of it is that it's too good not to be true. For God does surprise us and unravel our plans with unexpected joy if, if we are willing to accept it. Thanks be to God. Amen.
Join me in the prayers of the people. Lord, we know there are 10,000 things that bring us sadness. Bring us laughter in these times. Heal those with your holy laughter as they come. Help us to bring laughter to another in these, again, trying times. Finally, Lord, help us to keep an open mind when our plans become some of your laughter. Now, with joy, let us say the prayer that Christ taught us to pray. Our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done, on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread, and forgive us our debts, as we forgive our debtors. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom, and the power, and the glory forever. Amen. which the morning stars began. Love divine is reigning o'er us, joining all in heaven's bloom. Ever singing, march we onward, victors in the midst of strife. Joyful music leads us onward in the triumph song of love. Now as you leave this place, wherever you are, may the road rise to meet you. May the wind be ever at your back. And until we meet again, wherever or however we meet, may God hold you in the palm of God's hand. And remember to laugh. Amen.